sing kumbaya. That's right. Good morning, everybody. We're going to get started. My name is Troy Swanson. I'm the library department chair. Thank you all for coming out for our uh, panel discussion. Today we're talking about um, our one book, which is Tony Horowitz's Confederates in the Attic and also the Civil War in general with um, our full-time history faculty, which is um, awesome. I'm excited to have them all here. Um, if I could join any other department besides being a librarian, this would be where I would go because these guys are great. Let me just do quick introductions. Uh, Mary Fifleese is going to be our moderator. To her left is Christine Van Baren. To her left is Jim McIntyre. And to his left is Josh Fulton. Josh and Jim were especially um, instrumental in helping me uh, select this book as well as Christine. Um, that's why we're making Mary be the moderator because um, these guys have done so much work. We're <laughs> no, I'm just joking. Okay, with, with no further ado, I'll turn it over to Mary. Thank you all for coming. Thanks, Troy. I thought that we decided I was going to be the moderator because I have the biggest mouth, and so that tends to be the, the role of the big mouth in the group. So that's how we, that's how we sort of collectively decided that one. So uh, we, we decided beforehand that we're going we're gonna, to you know, speak our piece, each of us, but if anybody has any questions at any point, please feel free to raise your hand. This is where I think we're a pretty casual group here. I don't think that we're... Uh, hold your questions to the end. We want to hear your questions, so feel free to, to chime in if you have a question or if you've got a comment on something that one of us has said. Forgive me there. Okay, so I thought we'd start off with a question uh, regarding the fascination, and, and this is something that Tony Horowitz talks about quite a bit in the book, uh, why Americans have such an obsession, and not even just Americans, but why there's such an obsession and a fascination with the Civil War that continues to linger today. So we could throw that one as the first one, and I'll open it up to one of my colleagues. All right. Um, <laughs> I, I think that part of that fascination comes with the, the human aspects of the conflict, of the, the numbers of people who, who died. Uh, of course, we have those statistics more recently that uh, perhaps those numbers have actually gone up. Uh, the role of or the fact that uh, the the conflict, of course, is not only just these set piece battles, but there is so much to be taken as well from from the home front uh, that it is a, a distinctly personal war. I think also, of course, you still have uh, a connection for for some families uh, of those who have served. I mean, you know, we could be having this discussion about the impact of, you know. A, a terribly brutal conflict, say, for the Thirty Years' War in, in 17th century Europe, but how many families have that sort of clear personal connection back to a conflict that ended in 1648? Uh, this is much more perhaps tangible, uh, I think, for some individuals. I was actually in Ottawa yesterday, Illinois, with some of my, my, my students, and we were, um, Ottawa was the site of the first Lincoln-Douglas debate in 1858, and they have a lar they've erected a large uh, war memorial, and th they had the original Civil War one. I think it went up in 1871 or 72, mm -hmm. but they've since then taken all the names because a lot of the names have faded off and have re -put, the put them in plaques in the ground mm. so you can read them even better, more clearly. And that was just done within the past 10 years, and I thought that was a really interesting way to kind of, so that you can actually read them and see, and looking at the names, the names were fascinating, of course, to look at just how different they are from today. Sure. But I think that is, an, an, it is very personal, especially when you know you can look back and trace your ancestry and say, you know, my great, great, great grandfather, and that was something that you heard quite a bit in the book, of uh, people that had that very personal connection to it. And it resonated, I think, with, with, with many. I, I think, just to, to follow up with what you're saying, I mean, Ottawa itself can be, in many ways, a metaphor for m many sort of small farm towns across mm -hmm. the United States. I mean, uh, you know, traveling in many of those places that would have been set down, say, in the mid-19th century, what's one of the, the major characteristics of their, their downtown center? It's usually a monument to men they've sent off to war, and very stereotypically, it's to men they sent off to the Civil War. Mm -hmm. Uh, so for, for many, many generations, what have they done? Grown up in the shadows uh, of that, mm -hmm. so. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. The family aspect was part of what drew me to the book when I first read it. My family's done a lot of genealogy research, and so the Civil War era is not one that I have focused a lot on when I'm looking at those individuals. I've tended to focus on others, but I could identify with many of the individuals in the book who had this connection mm -hmm. Uh, because they were so fascinated with a, a family member. Um, so I went back and checked because I knew we were doing this. I'm like, well, I, I guess I should look and see, did I have anybody that fought, that kind of thing. Uh, between my husband and I, we had seven veterans, wow. uh, <laughs> mostly fighting uh, for Illinois. 
all on the union side, mm -hmm. which makes it a lot easier for me to deal with remembrance kind of stuff. I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, they're on the right side. <laughs> uh, but it was kind of interesting to me to see that connection resonate with so many people where they became so wrapped up in those individuals that they're wanting to go back and see where their great-great-grandfather had fought and died. I could identify with some of them to some extent. Mm -hmm. you know, my identification wasn't necessarily with individuals in my family tree that um, fought in the Civil War, but I could identify with that element mm -hmm. um, to, to a degree. Some take it way too far. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to end it? I, I have nothing on this. Okay. <laughs> okay. I know as, just if, even as a kid, um, my because I'm, I'm the opposite. I, my roots, I'm, I'm first generation Greek, so I have no personal family connection to the Civil War. But I just remember as a child watching, um, my first introduction into the Civil War was watching North and South hmm. as a kid growing up on that miniseries, which back in the day, just to let you all know, the networks actually used to produce miniseries, the types of miniseries that you now see on cable used to be done on the networks. And they had the blue and the gray on CBS. Mm -hmm. North, ABC had North and South. And I remember being obsessed by it. And I think I was, I mean, largely I did like Patrick Swayze. That was part of the obsession. Who was, this was in his pre-Dirty Dancing days. So I liked that. But it's also just this, I, this notion of the, the whole brother against brother idea is very almost, not romantic, but it's just, it's, it's, I think it's what's something that people can identify with. Another thing that, that I also, reading as a kid, um, and obviously became much more critical of as I, as I got older, was reading Gone with the Wind in, in junior high, and loving that book. I loved that book. And I, that also got me interested in the Civil War, and obviously my, the, the slant that Gone with the Wind takes, I was unaware at the time, growing up, I thought, well, slavery is not that bad reading this book. You know, it's, it's, it's actually pretty good. Uncle Peter's part of Scarlet's family, and this is, this is great. Well, obviously, as I got a little bit older, and I, I started to realize that there's some, some definite major issues with, with uh, Gone with the Wind. But at least in terms of making it appealing, I don't necessarily think that makes something bad just because it makes it appealing to a wide audience, hopefully it, it, it's spurring that person to then go in and look into it more themselves. So, can we run another, uh, sure. another yeah, question? Sure. Um, question that, that, uh, that Jim had raised, the issue of, because uh, when Tony Horowitz, Horowitz was here, Back in September, he talked about that it was a shame to him that the Civil War is not commemorated as much as he would like to see done. Right now, this is the 150th anniversary of the Civil War. Uh, just in September, they were talking about the anniversary of the Battle of Antietam. Um, and so I thought that's a question that, that's a good point to raise. Why hasn't the Civil War uh, been as commemorated as much? What has changed in our own um, country nowadays that we don't commemorate it as much? I'll field that one. Um, <laughs> I, I think what's really interesting, and it was kind of a throwaway line when Tony Horowitz was here that I wish we'd kind of picked up more, was he, he said he was really wish he had seen more being done right now because it's the 150th anniversary of the Civil War. And you and I were, were kind of discussing that question the other day. I think part of it is it's the 150th anniversary. You know, it's, it's kind of odd. It's in between. You know, like you see things, I, my specialty is, is the American War of Independence. And so you see lots of things being done at the centennial in 1876. You don't really see anything done in the early 20th century. And then 1976 is a huge party. Um, so it, it's kind of those odd years that, or those odd anniversaries. But I think also it, it bespeaks to maybe there are other issues. I, I, to be clear, I don't think that the issues raised in the American Civil War are dealt with by any wild stretch of the imagination. However, I do think that perhaps a couple of things are going on. Part of the, as you mentioned, the fascination with the Civil War has to do with the sheer scope. Mm -hmm. But I think we're also, as a country, engaged in a much different type of conflict today, a long war, a small war. Um, we have a lot of and, and I think part of that fascination, too, for reenactors was there was a period in there where there really weren't a lot of veterans, at least easily accept. World War II veterans are, are um, well known for not talking about what they did, for very much being quiet about it. I mean, they, they kind of answer questions when asked, but they don't really come out and just. You wouldn't see a panel of World War II veterans volunteering like this, shall we say. Um, and, and so I think you have a much greater level of awareness right now with, with current events. And I think some of that is, is focusing, you know, if you're going to look at war, and, and, it, and it really clearly undercuts the romantic aspect that, that can happen with reenacting. Uh, you know, it's, um, 
Yeah, and, and I'll kind of leave it there. Well, I yeah. think some of it has to do with the racial issues. I think that's yeah. something that you see in Horowitz's book, where mm -hmm. repeatedly he's saying, well, you know, they go do the reenacting, but they just leave the racial element of it completely ignored. Mm -hmm. uh, and he, try, he finds element where there's still a lot of racism. We live in a racist society. I mean, there's a lot of racism there, and it just it is. But and that's one of the big themes within the Civil War that's never really been completely addressed. Mm -hmm. And the reenactments and the remembrances and the monuments was kind of stuffing that down and ignoring that element to it. But we also live in a society where we're trying to be more aware of those things and respectful of those things. And I think in the transformation that happened after the war ended mm -hmm. and the different remembrances where it started out where it's memorials to people who had died. I mean, you have a nation where there is massive death. You know, almost every family is being touched by this and they're trying to remember their loved ones who died. Uh, you know, for, for my family, you have a father who took his 12-year-old son with him uh, to battle and the 12-year-old son died in battle. So I, you're dealing with families who are really hurting. So it started out where it was memorializing the people who had died. And then it turned into monuments and it turns into, um, you know, really turning, uh, you know, Lee and Jackson and Davis into these kind of pop culture icons and, and it's more monument instead of memorialization that happens. Right. But all of that is kind of stuffing some of the hard issues to deal with. But then it's struggle for, for those of us now where all of that's kind of meshed together along with the Gone with the Wind stuff, mm -hmm. where we have oh, this yes. kind of mixed yeah. up view mm -hmm. yes. that how do we honor those who fought and, and the bravery and the skill and all that without demeaning and hurting others. Right. And it's such a difficult thing that sometimes we just don't. Do, uh, I would, go, go ahead. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Uh, do, we, do we think that maybe it's, I mean, to your, to your point, Christine, and maybe on, on Jim's as well, then that it's, it's easier to memorialize wars that we understand the nature of the causes more effectively? Mm -hmm. Whereas there is no, I mean, I, I think perhaps from our perspective, there is a clear sense that, well, slavery was the cause of the Civil War. But for many other individuals, that's not that clear. Uh, and they are more than willing to continue to debate that to no end. Mm -hmm. And that that, and debate is good, debate is a fantastic thing. Um, but that that, uh, you know, perhaps maybe uh, halts some of our understanding or halts our ability to remember effectively because there is a, a side, as you sort of say, that is perhaps, um, you know, unwilling to sort of address what it is that their relatives or those who they think of fought for. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, what was in fact the Confederacy? What mm -hmm. was in fact this understanding? Yes, only you know, 20, 25 percent of Southern whites own slaves, but yet you still get all of these individuals who flock to the banner of a, a, a nation that, that put that forward. Uh, now, they may not have done so necessarily for that, but that they're still flocking to that banner. Uh, and so, you know, I, I agree. I think it's a, a tough question. Right. Actually, that's and if you, I'll jump out. You, that's one of the questions that was on here. That what, what is the appropriate way to remember the Civil War? Is it possible to honor people who fought in the Civil War on the Confederate side without necessarily insulting others and ma making others feel diminished? I think that's that's an, and I think that's one of one of yeah. the scenes that you see in the book uh, that oh, yeah. Horowitz when yeah. he talks about when he's dressed in a Confederate uniform and he walks uh, into a store that's mainly filled with African Americans and and he feels like everyone is looking at him. Now again, we're not in the heads of those people that were there. We don't know if every one of them was saying, because nobody said anything to him, but he felt himself uncomfortable. And then I believe after that, he ends up wearing his, his, yeah, his uh, union, union uniform, and his, he's uncomfortable with wearing the Confederate uniform because of what it represents. So again, is it, is it, I, I do think it's possible to be able to honor and be proud of your ancestors and to be able to, to commemorate them without necessarily offering insult, because it's, it's your history and that's a very personal thing. Uh, someone, you know, you looked up and you researched what happened to your own family, that means something to you. That's, that's how you derive some of your identity. And I think that's something that in, in American society, I would, I would make the contention that we're kind of lacking a sense of identity. Some people feel that they are lacking an identity. And so the search for finding where you come from and finding your, uh, tracing back your genealogy and finding out who fought in the Civil War is, is your way of claiming um, your identity and, and who you are. I mean, it's, I think it's difficult in a society when, when there, our economy is so globalized and there's, we're always inundated with so much information to kind of really figure out kind of who you are and, and what you stand for. Personally, I know who I am and for what I stand for based on where I come from. 
and I'm very proud of it to know that I'm the daughter of an immigrant and that I'm the great, that I'm a, uh, the granddaughter of immigrants who came here with nothing and my father left Greece after the Civil War and watched several of his brothers die and, and just went through famine and just horrifying experiences. That has helped shape who I am. So I don't necessarily think that it's a bad thing for people to want to also know where they come from. And if they find that creative outlet in expressing it through Confederate War reenactment and getting that bond, I don't personally necessarily feel that's a bad thing. However, I'm speaking as a Caucasian woman. Maybe if I were African American, I might look at it differently because that uniform would represent something else to me. Actually, one thing that, that we, I wanted to backtrack to, um, the National Park Service made a rule in the early 1990s that if you're act going to have a reenactment on federal land, you actually have to include sections on African American history, um, women's roles, and so forth. And you start noticing after that a, a decline in a lot of the reenactments being held on National Park Service sites. And, and not that that should be taken as, as specifically insidious. Some groups just have a hard enough time getting anyone to go, to show up, period. Yeah. Um, so it, you know, that, yeah, that can be an issue as well. If yeah. you're trying to get the, as numbers as well as diversity, that, that could be asking for just a little bit too much. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But they, they did pass that rule, and it's definitely had an effect. And I think to some extent that contributes to some of the decline in commemoration that Tony Horowitz was talking about mm -hmm. when he was here. Mm -hmm. so. that's, a good, that's a good point. I guess maybe we can also ask the question about what draws, because um, one of the issues that we talked about, because we had some, some spirit debates before we even got in here, about the reenactors. And, and one of the points that, and I'm not going to, Jim, I'll let you talk about it, but just the issue of the, of the reenactors that, and then what their, their role and kind of what draws them to them and, and, and are they being generalized and sort of trivialized in, in, in this book. So um, I know I'm putting you on the spot, but Jim, you want to start off with that one oh, and, and sure. then we'll uh, mm -hmm. go from there? In my checkered past, <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I, I can actually claim one of the coolest jobs ever for someone in, interested in history. I worked as a tour guide at a historic site, so I got paid to fire cannons a couple times a day, um, which was a lot of fun. But And I also worked with a myriad different group of reenactors. I worked with uh, Rev War reenactors, uh, Medieval, the Society for Creative Anachronism, um, <laughs> whatever they are. Um, Civil War reenactors, uh, Napoleonics, World War II, so a lot of different groups. And uh, there, are, there were definitely the Robert Lee Hodges. Mm -hmm. um, and, but I think, and one of the problems with that is a lot of people are just really interested in history. With the Civil War people I dealt with, a lot of them would show up to events at the site with a blue and a gray uniform. And they would just say, you know, whatever they, whoever we need, I'll be. Because they wanted to, wanted to, you know, you, if you're going to have an event, you, it really is bad. And this actually, this site was actually in Pennsylvania, so you had a better chance of getting um, more Union soldiers. So, and it looks, you know, it just doesn't look right if you've got, you know, 25 Union guys and two Confederates. <laughs> um, so, you know, you have a lot of people who are are very interested, devoted amateur historians, and do this on weekends. Um, and a lot of it is communal as well. And I think he really misses that point that, yeah, you get together and you dress up and you, you try to mimic living in the 19th century, but a lot of what I actually witnessed that he never really talks about in the book is comparing notes. Like, these guys talk a lot of history, and it's not the minutia of, you know, who had what type of button on their shirt. It's actually, you know, who, you know, have you read such and such? This just came out. Have you heard about this idea? And, and these guys would really get into it, and it was actually... Um, I, I, I would argue I probably learned more there than my first semester in graduate school. <laughs> um, but, you know, there, there was, so it, I think he kind of misses some of the nuance there, certainly. I think part, okay, I think part of that is because, and I'll be totally honest with you, well, I've, I find the Civil War fascinating. I don't find reenacting all that, all that fascinating. I don't. <laughs> And I kind of compare people that, that reenact battles as kind of like Trekkies. And all due respect to Trekkies, but people who learn <laughs> Klingon and who wear their Spock ears and go to conventions, and God bless them, they love it. Or people that go to like ComCon and they love True Blood and they wear their, their fangs. And, their, and again, I, I, maybe that sounds, I apologize if that, if that sounds disrespectful, but to, that's how it seems. It's not something that really does much for me. But I think if it's, if it's something that, that people, I think maybe that's where Horowitz was coming from, because I think he tries to show 
that there were people that, I think he mentions conversations where they talked about history and they were yeah. um, in some of their late night, but I, I do see also where it can come across as they're also trivializing it a little bit too. But it's kind of easy to understand that when you do have like a Robert Lee Hodge and oh, yeah. you know, Wait, yeah. He's, he's focusing, I mean, a, a bit on one aspect I think of the reenacting spectrum. Now that aspect of the reenacting spectrum is not what you would sort of say is the garden variety, you know, yeah. sort of reenactor. You know, most of those whom I've met or ever interacted with haven't necessarily sought to starve themselves so that they can play a particular sort of look or role or, or, or something to that effect. Now, Mary, I, I, I have to think that I'm somewhat of a cross actually between you and Jim where I, I, I think that, that reenacting provides a, a, a fantastic sort of gateway uh, for both those who are immersed within it uh, to perhaps engage in those discussions uh, that you were saying, uh, where you know that that community for them, and then also a gateway for those who are interested in aspects of history uh, to perhaps um, you know gain some insights in a more tactile way, as opposed to just you know sort of looking at a time life book on the Civil War, which are fantastic, but yet for some individuals they're going to look at it and go, oh my, this is ridiculous. Uh, but there is that other part of it of no matter how much you necessarily necessarily um, want to, you know, get it right and get it real and things, you're never going to because you weren't there. And unless we bring out the bullets uh, and the, you know, diseases, uh, it's just not going to happen. I mean, but the same thing can necessarily be said of many of the films that, that we hold up or show in classes of, you know, there's still not going to be, the speech patterns aren't going to be right. Um, you know, we're, we, we have Lincoln, the vampire hunter thing, but we've also got <laughs> Daniel Day-Lewis coming out with this new Lincoln, yeah. but, you know, unless he gets the speech pattern perfect, in, in a way, it's still wrong, um, you know, if you want to play it by the letter of the law. Uh, so I, I think that it is an important thing to have, but yeah, we need to perhaps understand that there are limits, I guess is what I'm saying. And I, I think you both raise a really important question with what's going to happen to Comic-Con now. <laughs> which have Abraham Lincoln Vampire Slayer. It's going to be overrun by Civil War reenactors. We have a question. A question? Yes, sir. In film, you mean, or um, no, in, 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 in the oh, in the collective that. memory. Yeah. So the way the generals of the civil, of the civil war are, are remembered. War okay. And were they great generals? Were they <laughs> <laughs> generals? Yeah. Which one? It depends on the one. Um, I mean, someone like Lee, for example, has always been held up, at least at the first half of the 20th century, as being this individual who could do no wrong, uh, that he was, in fact, a sort of Christ-like figure. He wasn't mm -hmm. that great of a combat commander. Um, I've actually heard him referred to as a mass murderer recently, because someone, this, this guy giving a talk made the point that um, after the 1864 election, it's pretty clear the North ain't given up <laughs> until this is over. So to keep fighting is really just killing lots of your men to absolutely no – you're going to lose. They're not going to stop until you surrender. Well, couldn't you say that about Grant, though, too? I mean, who was – Yeah. The <laughs> oh, certainly. And during yeah. the same campaigns, actually. Uh, yeah, too. oh, absolutely. Yeah. Let's go storm Cold Harbor. There's a good plan. <laughs> no. but, but Grant's actually never been recognized. I mean, he's always been kind of seen as – just like a bull in a china shop. Yep. Um, yep. With a lot of people that he can throw at it. You know, if we keep throwing people in, eventually we'll win. It, it gets more difficult when you look at, say, Phil Sheridan or Stonewall Jackson to kind of come down clearly on one side or the other, both of them. But in the end, I mean, I think that also kind of plays into the trivialization that, go, that often goes along with reenacting. You know, in the end, these guys were all human. They weren't, yeah. they weren't Aries. You know, um, they made mistakes. Um, and it's kind of like, you know, if, if I as an individual make a mistake in my own day-to-day -day life, it, it usually af tends to affect me. When you've got tens of thousands of people you're responsible for, it kind of moves out exponentially over how many people it affects. Do you think we're still grappling then with sort of the post-war deification of some of these leaders? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But that, I mean, that goes the same, you know, a few years ago we were in the same setting 
and uh, we had someone talking about World War II who was vilifying Patton. I mean, it had <laughs> pick your war. I'm sure 40 years from now, if, if not sooner, you know, we'll have people praising or damning McChrystal or, or Petraeus or whomever. No, yeah, I mean, Grant is a is a sort of a good leader in a way, but he's also, I mean, there's the whole anti-Semitism and everything else and yeah. all of that. Yeah, and what about Sherman? They named a tank after him for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> he kept going and going. And Wasn't it a phenomenal destruction of, um, it was like, like, you know, citizens and homes and stuff like that? Yeah. Well, yeah. It, it, it is, but the march to the sea itself has sort of been overblown yeah. greatly. By, by much of the civilian, uh, by much of the southern civilian populace, uh, there's an historian who teaches at uh, Ohio State University named Mark Grimsley. Uh, I, I took a course when I was an undergrad uh, with him, and he wrote a book called *The Hard Hand of War*. And he went back to do a study of the areas that Sherman had marched through and his, his army had marched through, and found that many of the houses that supposedly had been burned to the ground and everybody in them murdered or raped or both or everything were still standing. So, okay. Now, which isn't to say that obviously uh, horrific, you know, crimes of war uh, did not go on, which of course, you know, they did, uh, but to the extent to which the, you know, sort of popular image of that uh, exists, not so much. Now, Sherman was a brutal guy, his treatment of slaves who were, you know, fleeing their plantations uh, and making it to his army certainly bear that out. Uh, but, uh, you know, the, the idea that he was this, this absolutely terrible man who sought to lay waste to every aspect of the civilian population, you know, that's, that's a little hard to come by. And I think Mark in his book also uses a quote from a period newspaper where, he, uh, where they compared the Sherman's march to the devastation of the Palatinate which was something that happened in 17th century Europe around the time of the Thirty right. Years' War. And, and point being um, that, that the reality of that time was civilians being caught in the path of war was not uncommon. Really bad things happening to civilians in the path of war. And I mean, you know, Sherman wasn't the first. Uh, Louis XIV basically told his general, I want nothing to grow there because it was, a, it was an area where his, uh, his opponents were getting supplies. So he said, Burn all the farms. I don't care what you do with the peasants. They're peasants, you know. Um, then, well, and it goes on. Yeah, certainly it goes on afterwards. Uh, Vietnam, certainly the Second World War. I mean, I remember seeing a statistic recently. The Soviet Union had something like 1,900 towns and villages obliterated, just wiped off the face of the earth during the fighting. So, I mean, it's not something that... Well, what's the, the stat, if I recall correctly, something like 40% of all buildings in Germany were uninhabitable by 1945? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Japan too. What's that? Well, Japan. well that too, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, by the way, it was we're very walking, interesting. We're yeah, right, it was very interesting. I don't know if you guys remember the the um, the Japanese tourists who are fascinated by the Civil War, yeah. by Gone with the Wind, yeah, and and how they. I thought I thought that was such an interesting. And the how they were, of how they were late, yeah. how they were comparing Japanese culture to Confederate culture, the idea of the women being very delicate and very you know, and the men being these kind of these warriors, and, and I thought that was just such an interesting, interesting. Uh, and also comparison. suffering catastrophic loss. <laughs> right. Well, well, right. But I mean, I mean, that's, yeah, but yeah. that's part of it. I and mean, abject social poverty in everything else. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I think part of that commemoration with the South is is cer certainly a sort of. Um, praise of defeat, you know, I mean, and that's been going on, the cult of the lost cause. I, mm -hmm. I actually heard someone giving a paper a few years ago, and they were saying that the cult, of, the cult of the lost cause is something that most people believe came up after the Civil War, which is kind of this uh, early apologia, if you will, uh, by, by widows and, and survivors in the South that, okay, since we're living under this Reconstruction government, yeah, they fought for the wrong cause, but they fought, you know, they, they knew they were going to lose, but they, they kept down. going anyway, and there's something glorious and honorable about that. Um, Against the godless northern hordes. Okay, yeah, <laughs> those northern Visigoths. Um, but, you know, it, this, this guy was actually arguing that a lot of that lost cause rhetoric starts with the death of Stonewall Jackson, which is not even oh, midway yeah. through the war. Like Southern preachers are going, well, it's over for us now. Um, and yet they kept Oops. going. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Reading, mentioning, the, I'm glad you brought that up about the cult of the lost cause, because when I was reading this book, I actually 
took it to a, a totally different uh, level thinking about lost causes. And, and my, my aunt in Greece is obsessed with, with the Byzantine Empire and, and, and culture. And, and whenever I'm having a conversation with her, if we're talking about Turkey and the issue of, of the Greek Orthodox Church, I can never refer to Istanbul as Istanbul. I have to stop myself and refer to it as Constantinople. Um, 1453 and I, never right. happened. <laughs> right, right. We have nothing to see here. Please disperse. This you never just, happened. You just need the They Might Be Giants song and you'll be all right. <laughs> right. And she ta ta I remember being a child and her talking about a, a battle that occurred. It was a more of a massacre that occurred. And I, I was listening to her and trying to make sense of it because at the time I, I was still learning Greek as well. And I was like, oh, my God, that's horrible. You know, when, when, did, these, when did this happen? She's like, I was like in 1465 or something like that. And I was like, oh, well, okay. But to her... It's that like, is it, yesterday. It happened last she week, still yeah. commemorates it was May 29, 1453. She still will go, and I think she makes uh, a certain type of, of, of bread out of an offering that she takes to, to church for that to commemorate that. Now, don't get me wrong. Your average Greek is not sitting around thinking about the loss of Constantinople. <laughs> They've got economic woes on their mind much more <laughs> than they do the issue of Con But to her, it's very real, and it's very serious. And um, she supports, um, and I'm, I'm throwing my aunt under the bus here. She supports this uh, a party that is that, that carries the, the Byzantine symbol. Is still, and one of their platforms is trying to retake the. They want to retake. I don't think it's going to happen anytime <laughs> soon. That Constantinople is going to be retaken, or Istanbul is going to be retaken uh, by by Greece uh, in its present state. It's not going to happen. But I, I found myself machine also machine. thinking about yeah. people who also continue to cling to the Confederacy and what it means to them. And I think it, it happens kind of for, for a variety of reasons, what, what draws people to kind of keep clinging to this. And I, I would go back to that issue of, of identity. And I think one of the things that, one of the trends that I saw in reading the book were people that were, um, people that were laid off from their jobs, mm -hmm. people whose jobs have been outsourced, mm -hmm. um, who found themselves kind of obsessed by, by the Civil War and by this time, I think, when everything was good. And thinking that if we can somehow kind of return to that, it's going to make everything better. And they find sort of comfort in going into that other time period because it allows them to escape from their current reality. Yes, ma'am. Don't you think that a lot of it has to do with the South still delegitimizing this northern government? There is, you know, we, we really live in many ways in two countries. The South is very different. The culture of the Confederacy lives on in the South. They feel that this northern government is. I think you can even see it in the political system, you know, what's happening now, mm -hmm. even in the election, mm -hmm. with this trust of a centralized government. Um, I think it's residual from from the Civil War. You know, you walk on UT campus and you see Jeff Davis, you know, right in the middle, you know, this big, huge person, um, this, this, what do you call it? This, it's like an idol, this idol, this statue. Idol, this statue but they, Uh, you know, because what what exactly are we? Uh, what uh, what is it we're celebrating? But that's okay. So, 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 so what what are we celebrating? We're what you're saying because of the divisiveness that still exists, it, it that still exists. and there's still this feeling, uh, and that, that's actually one of the things that we that one of our questions that um, this feeling that so that that and I want to be careful not to generalize when we say they or we say because um, you know or do they still feel the sense of paranoia? Um, or this that they're kind of almost like looked down upon because of that. Is that a justifiable thing? And uh, one more thing that I'm missing one other part of it that, that you said that you just said too. Your question was sort of government. I think too. You know, yeah. the, way they, the, the way many people in the South still view the way people the still view the government is not a legitimate government. as not being legitimate. <laughs> I think that there, you're going to find pockets of that feeling, though, not just in the South, but I think across the country too, where you find you find pockets of that here in Illinois, yeah. where people well, here. Yeah. And, and there is something to be said that when you do that. When you that, live yeah. down south um, and you scratch the surface, the Civil War is still very much going on down there. Did you hear that? Um, the, the Civil War is still very much going on in the South. But I think a lot of that too, because I, I go down there pretty routinely for 
uh, conferences and so forth. Um, I think a lot of that also has to do with where you go. Like I've been to conferences in Charleston and Tallahassee. Tallahassee is a little bit of a mix of both worlds because it's really kind of a small town except it's the state capital. So you have like the capital building and then a small town around it. Um, and, I, and I've also been to Lugoff, which is a, a hamlet in South Carolina. And, and so like in Charleston and, and the other major cities, I don't think you see, it, it's becoming more and more cosmopolitan. So you don't see as much of that, you know, you see the general civil what, you know? <laughs> um, uh, you, whereas in, a, in like a more rural setting, you would see more, uh, more awareness you know, and I and partially, I think some of that too, is if if you go into some of the more rural areas of the South, Sherman's March was the last thing that ever happened there. You know, I mean, like that's like their biggest thing ever. So of course it's going to. I mean, yeah, what else? So the, on this spot, Sherman once stood. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. there's nothing else that ever happened there. <laughs> you know, it's yeah. like. You know, I mean, I grew up in a small town outside of Philadelphia, and they had, like, this, this one monument to, like, where the British marched through. And, and I, I've since learned that most of the people living in that town at the time were loyalists, which doesn't surprise me. But, um, you know, and they had this monument and because it was the only thing that ever happened in my town. History. Like, the next thing they did, no lie, was they put up a monument when Ronald Reagan came to speak there in, like, 1980. Because <laughs> that was the, it's, you know, revolution, 1980. Nothing, Nothing in between, Nothing ever. So what do we memorialize? I, I agree that part of what you're saying in terms of the understanding of government, I think that the civil rights yeah. movement certainly bears it out that many, particularly Southern governors and others within political leadership, felt that the construct of secession was still an absolutely viable thing. And we've seen other governors and other individuals more recently argue that that is absolutely a legal thing, hearkening back to the, you know, the constitutional conventions of the different states when it came to ratification and everything. Um, but I, I also get concerned when it comes to this question of, I, I agree with you in, in a way that there are aspects of, in, in many southern states, the Civil War is much more tangible uh, for many individuals to address. But it also belies the idea that in the North, that's completely the opposite of, in the North, we think everything's great and we treat everyone equally and we treat everyone with respect. Chicago is more segregated than half the South, yeah. uh, you know, and so to completely ignore that, I think also does our own identity a disservice greatly. Absolutely, I was I was going to say the same that, that I think I do think that in the North we have this this sort of moral superior, this thing of like where we're morally superior to oh, those yeah. in the South. And Martin Luther King, when he came up here in 67, was trying to, to discuss the issue of education with, with Mayor Daley, said that Chicago is the most segregated city. Oh, yeah. And, and, it, and it is extremely segregated. Um, and I, I was also going to bring up when you, what you said, ma'am. You brought up a, a great – thank you for bringing it up because it's, it's uh, bringing up a lot, of, uh, a lot of other points, I think. I remember watching a documentary a couple years ago done by Alexandra Pelosi. She was doing that on HBO about the, the 2008 election. And she went down south. And she was uh, somewhere in Mississippi, in a small town in Mississippi. And she was asking people just at this truck stop who they were voting for. Mm -hmm. And this, this man filling up his, his big 18-wheeler said, well, I ain't voting for Obama. And she said, well, why? And he's like, well, I ain't voting for don't damn. And then, of course, he throws out the, in, the N-word. There were two black men, older black men, sitting on a, on a bench on the other side of the, of the gas station. So she goes over to them and she starts talking to them about politics and she says something about, well, about who are you going to vote for? And then she mentions, well, you know, this guy said, this guy over here said this. And the guy's like, listen, lady, he, I was shocked by his reaction. He said, um, you know, you come down here from the north and act basically all superior towards us and you're going to point out southern racism to us, but I'd rather have a guy who says it right to my face than have the, have the backward, the uh, kind of sort of uh, hidden racism that exists in other parts of the country. And I thought that was just a very profound, interesting, interesting point. And one last thing that I would say is, yes, are we, sometimes in this country, are we superficial in the way that we deal with certain aspects of, of race relations? And are we politically correct about certain things? Yes, we are. But I do think that sometimes you do, you do need to fake it till you make it. Sometimes you have to. And it takes time. It takes just the, the same way that, that it's been 150 years since the Civil War, and these issues still resonate. But it takes time. And this is we're, this is us. You know, we're here. We're today. We're gone tomorrow. 
Um, people are still going to be working through this, but this takes generations of people to kind of work through their feelings about things. We actually had a question up here. Oh, yes. Um, how would be if, if it was if, if homosexuals mean? Can you elaborate a little bit more? Instead of a fight against slavery, to fight against homosexuals, I think it correlates with today's national coming out day. Absolutely. So the issue, you're relating the issue of civil rights to that of, of homosexuals coming out and, and the issue of, of homosexuality being looked down upon and, and discrimination against homosexuals? I've seen how a lot of the slavery is treated a lot of homosexuals. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, there is, you know, it, that's, you're bringing up a very interesting argument and um, kind of a, a touchy one too because um, yes, there, the, I think that on the issue of civil rights that, that um, for homosexuals, obviously there's been great progress recently in the past few years with uh, the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, um, the issue of gay marriage being passed in certain states and likely that's coming up on the docket before the Supreme Court this fall as well. Um, and also, and so yeah, and so there are people that, that I think you definitely can make that comparison in terms of, of um, are people being treated unfairly, African Americans being treated unfairly, homosexuals being treated unfairly. Absolutely, I don't think that you can really deny that. What's interesting is that you also do have a little bit of, of, of cultural, um, well, I think, I think, I think I'm, gonna, I'm gonna leave it there for now, and maybe I'll come back to I'll hear my colleagues on this before I, go ahead. I'm gonna, any, any thoughts on this one? I see, Mostly I mean, there's another. definitely a comparison. I, I, I guess I'm not quite sure what, if you're asking, is it the same or is it? Are you is saying, it, are you, are you that saying that, that homosexuals today um, are still receiving the same kind of treatment that African slaves did? Is that what you're trying to say? Not to that extreme, but a lot of how people treat them, there are correlations. So, mm -hmm. I, would it be more like a comp uh, an, an, an analogy to say, the, well, yeah, the oh, beginning of the civil rights movement. America's saying maybe. that they've strived and made so much progress, yet they're being treated the same way slaves Well, I wouldn't I think say I, I, yeah, slaves. They're, they're, not, I, I, they're I, not treated the way that slaves yeah, I, I mean, I think I wouldn't say that at all. I, I think you could make a case. In terms of discrimination, certainly, yeah, I think. But I yeah, okay. I, I think you can make a case on, on, say, like a comparison between um, homosexuals today and, and African Americans in the early 1950s as the civil rights movement mm -hmm. is kicking off. Yeah, and I think I, I think you would have a, a, a better analogy there as to sort of national temperament versus a push for greater recognition and equality. But I, I, I don't think that, that the, the analogy to the Civil War would fit at all, and I, I wouldn't no. make it. But mm -hmm. You actually had another comment. I did. But I, I, I keep thinking about, you know, the celebration of the Civil War. What is it that we're celebrating? Why should we? And I want to ask you, in reenactments, would you be as um, apt to say we should be celebrating if we were reenacting the Second World War? Would it be just as good to, be, to, 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 to reenact the Nazis? Or would we, you know, get a little bit of a different feel there? Because really, for some people, as I said, in the South, we are looking at secession, the delegitimization of the whole centralized government, um, the Northerners as a group, again, as a whole, um, look at, you know, a, a treasonous acts from the South um, and people who fought to maintain slavery. Would we elevate people who wanted to, to destroy Jews? or destroy homosexuals, or take away rights from a number of people to say that slavery is, is you know, I know what you're gonna tell me it was an issue of states' rights, but that's also oh, no. code yeah. word, you yeah. know, yeah. for maintaining, maintaining our specific way of life. So to tie it into what you were saying, um, would we be celebrating the, the you know, Holocaust of Jews or the mass um, destruction of gays 
um, of lesbians. I mean, I, I, I could see where you're tying that in. So for, in terms of reenactment, in terms of celebration of the Civil War, what are we celebrating? Down south, absolutely. Almost everybody who lives down there in a small town can, has more than three or four or five ancestors who fought. So you can see where they would want to honor their own ancestors. But in terms of celebrating a civil war, what, what are we celebrating? Now, why? Would you feel the same in terms of celebrating the Second World War and the Nazi role in that civil war? Because there are Nazi reenactors. Mm -hmm. We have some in our government. Okay, and this few con oh yeah, a few Congress people were outed. Um, a well, couple of years ago. I don't, I don't know about that part. I know there's World War II reenacting. As far as like celebrating the delegitimization of a government, we do that every July 4th. Um, <laughs> so it's, it depends on, some of it depends on, on your perspective there. Um, World War II reenacting, yeah, is a big deal. And there were, for, for the longest time, there was actually a ban on, on forming any kind of SS unit. So like there were people who would reenact. And, and again, you kind of need both sides to, to play, if you will. And I think some of that, some of the problem, and I use that verb consciously, to play. Um, some of it I don't, you know, I, I think people get into it and they don't really understand. They don't think of it on the terms of I'm making a political statement, okay, um, by doing this. Uh, I did hear uh, that ban has, has kind of eroded in the past few years, and I actually had a student in one of my classes who, who reenacted, did re World War II reenacting, and he was telling me about these guys who, who nearly got um, nearly got beat up over at, a, at an event in Michigan because they were reenacting re the Germans and they put up a sign over their camp, Arbeit macht frei, which is what they had at the yeah. gates of Auschwitz. Yeah, yeah, it was gone by the end of the day. Um, and, and then you have, like, I mean, a lot of it does get very socially challenging. Um, another, another period that's grown in popularity recently is Vietnam War reenacting. Um, and, and part of that that's uh, downright creepy, in my opinion, is you have, no, I mean, you have these guys who are reenacting the Vietnam War and they're wearing their, their dads or their uncles or their grandfather's uniforms. I mean, the, the real, you know, the actual stuff. Um, I know for a while in Europe, World War I reenacting was really big and they would actually get dog tags made um, of, of dead soldiers on either side. Um, so that to me kind of stretches to the macabre. That's, that's the Robert Lee Hodges aspect of things. Um, just a little bit too creepy to, to want to talk to. Um, I'd be well, a proud well, World War I reenactment was thing, something that was going on as World War I was, was going on. We had a... Um, a, a fair to raise money for uh, for soldiers in World War One in the fall of 1918 in Chicago in Grant Park, where we dug up Grant Park and put trenches in it and staged mock battles. Uh, so, you know, they also were having biplanes doing dogfights over the loop, which I don't think would necessarily go too well today. Um, but I, I think to part of your point. Um, it's that question of relating to Mary's of, of identity, of how can you necessarily uh, justify honoring a, you know, an individual who fought. You, know, you may say or someone may say, okay, well, I don't believe in slavery. I think slavery is bad. I believe in equality. Ergo, my ancestor couldn't have thought that too. Uh, you know, that that's not possible. The same thing necessarily might be true, I think, for someone who maybe has a German ancestor and says, you know, I want to honor the service that my ancestor gave, even though, uh, of course, it is quite apparent, I think, uh, that, you know, obviously those individuals were complicit in a pretty awful thing. And they're banned in Germany, though. You cannot that's true. true. That's, 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 that's true. Um, but I, I think that part of... Um, it's, 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 it's th that, um, that, that reenactments and, and forms of honoring service in the German military are, are during World War II are banned. Um, totally banned, right. Um, but you also can't display a swastika in Germany. Right. Um, you also can't deny the Holocaust in Europe either. Yeah. That's also a but, crime. But, but, but that part of that revolves around this, the issue in German history as to, the study of German history as to whether or not it was a sort of cabal of, of, of a small cabal of Nazis uh, that were, were fully responsible for everything as opposed to the broader public that had no idea. 
And I think that that's something that, that Germany is still grappling with, especially with the fact that the wall just came down, you know, just over 20 years ago. Um, many within the generational sort of divide of Germany haven't really admitted that yet. And you also get, like, a, a, an issue, too, that, that kind of arose for me. Watching these, like, I actually stumbled over a Vietnam reenactment at one point. And, uh, again, it, it, it's a very nuanced thing because you have these guys who are reenacting the Viet Cong side in America. And, and there are still numerous Vietnam War veterans around who probably wouldn't appreciate that. On, <laughs> But then again, to be practical, what do you need to reenact Viet Cong? Sandals, black shirt, black pants. It's a, I mean, one of the things about reenacting that you find if you talk to any one of them, that's a, most of the time, Civil War and before is a huge financial investment. You're talking, before you even get equipment, $1,000 sometimes for your clothing. You know, and especially if you go like 18th century when they had very fancy uniforms, 1500, 2000. Um, because they tend to make them out of the authentic materials, and, and then and that's where they get kind of goofy too, with you know what buttons you wore and so forth. And of course, ten to fifteen thousand if you want a suit of armor for medieval. <laughs> well, <laughs> mine's on order. Oh right, okay. right, right. Joe, yeah. It's higher. It's really high. I mean, a lot of people actually die right. in these, in these uh, camps. Right. Right. Oh, Camp Douglas, yeah. Camp Douglas. Um, There's Helmira in New Jersey. And, and Andersonville, Anderson of course. Um, like 30%. I, I, I don't know the specific death count in terms of prison camps, but I can say, of course, that more died as a result of disease. Uh, as opposed to actual battlefield related, you know, battlefield injuries and things like that, or being in the battlefield, um, most individuals died because of infections, because of you know camp life, uh, and and their experiences there. Um, you know, in terms of you know prison camps and things, those death rates are also very high. Certainly, you know, you've got a um, you know a cemetery where you have a mass grave. I believe it's on the north side of Chicago, where you have about 6,700 uh, you know Confederate POWs who are interred there. Uh, of we don't know who many of them are. Uh, I know that one of them is a relative of President Clinton, um, but that you know there is this sort of complete lack of knowledge of sort of surrounding all that. But it's the d issue of disease, really. And that's oh, excuse me, that's because so many were dying so quickly that it, by the time they, they mentioned that in the issue with Andersonville that trying to build graves for each one of them originally but then when you had 125 dying a day right at one point you just couldn't you couldn't dig graves for you couldn't keep up with all those people so they end up being, end, up, end up in mass mass graves which also in the end makes it very hard to calculate you know I mean we throw these numbers around and, and the reality is it, you can it, it's very easy to get lost like when you, you hear these astronomical numbers for Civil War battles but then it, it's how do the, how does the historian doing it break it down? Mm -hmm. You know, was that on the battlefield versus died as a result of wounds and or surgery right. Right. later on, um, or died as a result of maybe not of the surgery but of the you know ether that was used. Oops, yeah. <laughs> a little bit too much. Right. Um, and, and so there's and, and a lot of that um, doesn't get very nuanced, or if it gets nuanced, it's very easy to. to you're kind of staring at the book going, okay, what are you trying to tell me? You know, what does that all mean? Like, there are people who have done very good statistical work on the Civil War, but they don't really tell you at the end what that tells you. No, they don't. <laughs> you know? Not at all. It's just a lot of numbers, really impressive big numbers, but what do they mean? So. Yes. Can I just follow up on that topic about, like, treatment of prisoners? Sure. Mm -hmm. experience in the Civil War? Like, did it change the way that our armies or our military treated our policy towards prisoners of war? Did the Civil War have any influence on that? I, other than that we would need to create perhaps a more effective institution in order to be able to house them, to my knowledge, I'm not that certain. I, I don't think that, I guess that gets into the, was there a, a and pardon me, did I cut No, go ahead, go ahead. What, was there a purpose on the part of either government trying to deliberately hurt the prisoners of war. And I don't think that a lot of it was just neglect of the fact that they were, the Confederacy didn't have food to feed its own people, let alone to feed the prisoners that were there. Um, 
and I, so I don't know if it's necessarily, necessarily fair to say that, that there was a, a um, if they had to learn a lesson. I if, if you no. want guys want I just don't I know think we learned how to draft soldiers better, we, but that's yeah. not really your question. Yeah. But and even with, um. the, I mean, with how German POWs were treated in World War II, were treated yeah. quite well. Here. Oh, very, I mean, very well. They were treated well. better than yes. African American soldiers Absolutely. were treated. Yeah. So I, I mean, but I don't know if that's necessarily a lesson learned from the Civil yeah, War. If it's just more of just sort of the evolve, evolve a progression or a lesson yeah. learned of basic medical care right, and things right. like that. Mm -hmm. Because of there are so many famous, like Andersonville. Sure. I think you'd have to look at the Spanish-American War yeah, and the nice. treatment of, uh, um, you know, by American, the American military, you know, in, in Cuba and in Puerto Rico and probably in the Philippines during the Philippine insurrection in order to probably get a good answer to that question. Uh, because, you know, I would have to think that, you know, the treatment of prisoners in, in the World War II era might be dictated by our experiences in France, uh, you know, in World War I. Yeah. Uh, so I, I, I am not a, a sort of Spanish-American war scholar. Perhaps somebody else can speak to that. Well, I, don't know. I know that, I mean, people were tort there was torture done in, in, in the Philippines yeah. of, of Oh, of course, to absolutely, yeah. So I don't know if that's a direct correlation. Yeah, and there was that, some really bad POWs. treatment. Um, so I mean, I'm not sure if there's a, I think, you might, I think you might have to go back to the point before. I more think you've stumped us. But, then, but you also get the problem in the Philippines that it's an insurrection, so it's, it's viewed as illegitimate to begin with, right. you know. And then, then you also bring in a, a racial component in, in the U.S. and the Philippines, so there's a lot of other variables that you have to take. But I, actually, to speak to one thing, um, there, was a, there was a Union prisoner of war camp in Elmira, New Jersey, where as they found out about, that, that's the one I mentioned, it was nicknamed Helmira, because when the, when the commandant there found out about Andersonville, he decided to starve the Confederate prisoners in, in reaction and retribution. So, I mean, the North doesn't have, and, and I mean, it, it you know, kind of spe it's like Grimley's, Grimsley's title, the hard hand of war. As the war progresses, it gets really ugly. I mean, both sides, yeah. it gets very vindictive on both sides, as wars tend to do. So Yeah, the head of Camp Douglas has similar activities, yeah. and yeah. And yet they, but yet they execute the commandant of, of Andersonville for war crimes when it's well, you know. it's kind of like yeah, which which is and and that that's one of the one of the sort of points in, in Horowitz's book that I can relate to. All of these guys are pretty much equally guilty of malfeasance. You know, they're equally war criminals, but the loser right. yeah, is the one who gets executed. Right, so. right, right, absolutely. I mean, we still have we still have some time. Are there other other questions that from the audience? Let's see. Our department meetings at three thirty. <laughs> so we could just keep going. Yeah. We a, there's a question we could we could address if you guys if you guys are, are game, sure. uh, about how the Civil War is being taught today. I thought it was an interesting question um, about perhaps and and Horowitz the, the, at the end of the text today they there's a couple of questions out there and one of them is looking at it from a racial perspective how are black and white students approaching the war differently in the Civil War in the in the text in the book and is there is there a sense of, of any common history common American history maybe we can kind of take that and even piggyback that with how we approach Maybe the Civil War and teaching it in our own classrooms, and if, if, if that's okay with you guys, any any thoughts on that? Well, in one defense of the instructors that he meets in the book, you know, where they kind of end up ignoring it some, uh, is the way that our sections are divided. Where if you've fallen behind, if you're teaching exactly. here History 201, yes. right, yes. American History 1, yep. you end with the Civil War and Reconstruction. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. if for whatever reason you have fallen behind from what your plan was during the semester you're going to have to really gloss over the Civil War and Reconstruction because you've ran out of the semester. And similarly, you know, 202 starts, you know, you might get a little bit of this was Reconstruction and then off you go. Mm -hmm. And so the way it's divided up, yeah. and I don't know if that was purposeful or not to avoid the conversation. Right. I have no idea how that was question. done. I don't know. That's a new thought. Uh, oh. But it, it lends itself to kind of ignoring or glossing over some of these things unless the instructor is one who really wants to focus on these things and makes a greater effort to do so. Mm -hmm. um, so some of the instructors that he meets, it's already going to be a big challenge for them uh, anyway, mm -hmm. given their surroundings, that it kind of makes it easier to gloss over mm -hmm. stuff. Mm -hmm. And I think, is he going to grade schools, I believe, or is he in high schools when he, I thought it was high schools. Was high, high school, yeah. Right, and so I'm not sure what their time, their time frame is, if they have more time to be able to devote to it, but I would echo Christine's point completely, that usually I end up having one to two days to cover the Civil War, 
if I, with even the way that by the time you fit in research things that we're doing and other exercises that we're doing in order to get it all in, I find and it's it's a shame because I know students really want to spend time on it, but I also want them to be reading some some diaries of Civil War soldiers and to kind of get an idea of what was going on with people back home on the home front as opposed to just talking about the battles that I think have been talked about ad nauseum. Um, and I'm sure there's always one more aspect that we could we could look at, but that's just again that's not my thing in particular. Um, yes. Teachers still tell, still talk about the Civil War as a war of northern aggression. Yes, yep. in their in their um, classrooms. Right. So I think the way it's taught in a very intellectual and broad base and in a college and university environment is very different from the way it's taught because we do have different curricula. The North oftentimes has we have different books that we use up here than they might use down south. So it's kind of an interesting. It would be interesting to see how, you know, the majority, if they are covering it, you know, down south versus up north, how, you know, how are the differences being taught? Are there differences at all? I mean, when you have a, a population and, and an educational system and a large amount of the population that still refers to the war in northern aggression, um, you know, there might be some differences in perspective. We know history is, you know, the way we view things. We view things through our own prism. And we, we talk about things with our own world view. So uh, I think it would be interesting. I don't know if you know, um, if you could share what you know about what's being taught at the elementary and the high school level. Because I just know some small pockets from well, I, Do you mean here or you, you mean in the South? Across yeah. the board. Here, in, in the South, are there differences? Um, are, can we generalize oh anything? Well, I only know anecdotally from, I had a former student who was, well, she was from Wisconsin, she was in the National Guard, she took some classes here, um, and then she was stationed in the South, and I forget exactly which state, but Deep South. And um, she was taking college classes there, and then she came back and had, she, she found me, she hunted me down to, to tell me about this. Um, she was taking a, a U.S. history course where the professor taught that the South won the war. Oh, right. <laughs> How did they pull that one? <laughs> and and wow. anecdotally, um, growing up in California, I, I took a class on genealogy just to see what, how they would teach it. Uh, and there was a lady in the class who had grown up in the South. She had a beautiful accent. Um, and in genealogy, the Civil War is one that people tend to go to a lot. And so that was being covered. And finally, she raised a question. She's like, I keep hearing about the Civil War. What are you talking about? She had never once heard of the Civil War. Now, this was in the late 90s that I was taking that class. And the South is a very different place now right. um, right. than it was when Horowitz was doing the, the sure, research right. for the book, mm -hmm. um, even from when my student was down. You know, and it's an anecdote. I don't know that that's across the board. Mm -hmm. I, I think that was that one instructor, maybe, <laughs> I hope. Um, I, I mean, I had a student yeah. a few years ago who was, who was uh, former U.S. Army, born and raised in Texas, and, and, and swore up and down to me that you know, the Civil War was about states' rights, and, and you know, well, and to me, that's, yeah, this, you know, the, your rights under the state to own another person. <laughs> um, <laughs> but that's, you know, I mean, I don't, but yeah. that's, you know. Oh, absolutely. Well, and, and I, but I think you see, like, a, a, also a social divide there. I think plantation owners meant one thing by states' rights, what I just said, and I think the propaganda that a lot of the, the you know, I mean, e and, and, and I don't want to denigrate the Confederate soldiers. The Confederate soldiers themselves referred to it as a rich man's war, poor man's fight. They got what was going They were being used by their social superiors or the social elites to fight this war. Um, but, I, but they were also, you know, sp spoon-fed this propaganda of the North's going to come down and basically tell you what to do. It's not just going to, you know, they, they were spoon-fed from the 1840s on this idea that if slavery ends, you know, it'll be Armageddon. There'll be a massive race war. All these, all, you know, just this whole laundry list of evils would befall the entire South. So they almost... And, and, and if you are propagandized, I mean, you know, we, we get a much better modern example of this when you look at the denazification process after World War II. You have an entire generation brought up on an idea that Adolf Hitler is God. Well, what do you do with that? You know, um, you take 10, 15 years and you really actively, like I've actually seen pictures 
of a, of a German school teacher in the early 1950s standing there before a classroom full of middle school kids. I don't know. If, I don't suspect that this was the right approach pedagogically, but standing in front of these uh, grammar school kids, showing them a movie of uh, Auschwitz and the pi piles of bodies and everything, and saying, you know, literally screaming at these children, who is responsible, and point, you are, and you are, and you are. And I don't think pedagogically that's good. Um, I, I don't think that that's, I think that could create more problems than, than, solve, than it solves. Um, I certainly wouldn't try to my class, um, even with tenure, but, um, you know, but, um, you know, but, but nothing like that was ever done after the Civil War. You know, there, there, there were dramatic changes in education, i.e. African Americans could avail themselves of it in some respects and, and in a lot of locations. But other than that, there was no sort of approach to, okay, how do we change? I mean, to me, the, the, the big lesson out of the Reconstruction, I, I see it as in so many ways just an abject failure. But I think a lot of the things that, a lot of the failures that occurred there um, did inform some of the things that were done after World War II in Germany and Japan where it is much more successful, you know. Um, they're, they're, you know, we can talk about, but you don't really see like, you don't really see a lobby for imperialism in Japan these days. <laughs> you, you don't, though. I mean, you know, that's, that culture has been thoroughly revised, thoroughly kind of pushed to the side. And, and I think a lot of it was just an extreme amount of attention on education in the years shortly after the end of World War II. If I, yeah, if I may, um, I think the the teaching of it at least belies sort of two two elements. One is at least as far as um, you know, sort of an understanding of slavery. The fact that throughout Reconstruction and on to the early 20th century, and throughout most of the 20th century, U.S. views of African Americans generally were in many ways in line with what had existed in the mid 19th century. Yeah. You know, probably the most prominent historian at the beginning of the 20th century on on slavery is Ulrich B. Phillips who says that slavery wasn't actually a bad thing for African slaves. Now, most individuals today would say, no, uh, <laughs> that's a problem. Uh, but of course, you know, our, our, our shifting sort of social views, our shifting cultural views, uh, you know, I, I think are now sort of a reflection of, of how we're remembering the war. But also I think to this point of, of bias and the issue of the, the teaching of, of the Civil War, or at least aspects of the war, you know, in as much as we can see these issues of the War of Northern Aggression or what is the Civil War, that same thing can be said in the North, certainly. Um, you know, Rick Atkinson, who's a, a journalist uh, and sort of turned historian sort of thing, uh, wrote a book once about the graduating class of West Point uh, of 1966 uh, called the, the, the Long Gray Line. And in the book, he, he gives this quote where he says that America after World War II suffers something he calls the disease of victory. Uh, and I, I think in some ways, Northern memory suffers the disease of victory, of Lincoln has, at least for those who grew up in Illinois, for all intents and purposes, become the 13th apostle. Um, <laughs> there is nothing that one can say uh, you know, against Honest Abe because, well, he's honest, he has a nice beard, uh, and his hat is fabulous. He's a Chicago politician, or an uh, Illinois politician who wasn't indicted. Right, <laughs> that too, um, that too, of, you know, there is this this sort of connection, and, and you know, the anecdotal things that I've heard uh, are, are things such as, well, you know, all of a sudden the Civil War happened, and then Lincoln came in with the Emancipation Proclamation, then everything got better. Not really, uh, not at all. I've also heard some individuals talk to me about how instructors have told them about the the book that came out a few years ago about how Lincoln was a homosexual. Now, whether he was or not, okay, you know, that's fine, um, but. You know, telling you know those individuals were told by their instructor uh, that they they absolutely had to know that, and that if anybody ever told them different, uh, then that person was lying. Uh, and you know that is something I sometimes find troubling. Yes, there is a sort of strong standard in in a way in in Illinois versus Texas versus South Carolina that folks have to hold to, but sometimes you get those types of pushes which can can be troubling be they northern or southern in, in, in their tint. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I've, do, do we have time for one more, I think one more comment. 
Oh, maybe a couple, even another question. Uh, one of the things that I, I always discuss with my students, and when Jim, when you brought up the issue of reconstruction in what in it being a failure, um, is is partly I, I've always found this country to be rather moderate in its course, rather moderate, in it, and of course there are always exceptions to it, but for the most part we tend to stick to the middle ground, um, which is why I think slavery was not addressed. One of the reasons why slavery was not addressed at the time of the Constitution because the country was just too shaky to be able to be able to withstand that that pressure. Um, but we almost, we, we, we go through reconstruction, we pass a couple of amendments guaranteeing civil rights for black men and voting rights for black men. Um, we, you know, women were left out for a while longer. And then we go through where none of those rules were enforced and basically segregation is firmly embedded in the South. And then we get to the 60s, it's like everything's great. Everything's wonderful. It's, it's over, everyone can vote, everyone's happy. And I, I do think that, that to a degree, there has been some level of, we, we almost don't want to focus, it. we're afraid to keep focusing on it. We'd rather just move on put it to bed, put it to rest, and just kind of move on. And I, I tell my students often when they bring up issues like, well, why are we still talking about this? Why is this still relevant? Well, that was about 50 years ago that a lot of the civil rights legislation was passed. The enforcement of the 14th Amendment doesn't come until 1964. Mm -hmm. The enforcement of the voting of, of the 15th Amendment doesn't come until 1965. That's not all that long ago in, I think, in, in our, our collective consciousness. It's not that long ago. It's, it's, it's not even, it's a generation. People who are still around who went through that so I think that, that you know, <laughs> yeah, that I'm sorry, that's not. <laughs> but I, I, that's why I think that it is still important to talk about these things and to not act as though everything is kind of hunky dory because the is, these issues are, are still very real to, to, to very many people. Um, other, I think we're kind of. Yeah, I think we've been given the sign to yeah. wrap it up. Hey, thank you, everybody, for coming. Sorry. Yes, yeah, round of applause. Thank you. Thank you to our history faculty. This is great, excellent discussion. Thank you all for coming, and have um, a great afternoon. You should throw your drumsticks out the crowd. I think so. I was going to smash my copy of the better.